Why does God teach us faith? Why does God try to instill faith in us? I mean, he obviously lets us endure hardship. Obviously. Anybody who says that you don't have to endure it, you can have complete victory over every situation in your life, and you never have downtime, never have a problem. I don't believe they know God. I think they're faking. I don't think it's possible to not have trials, tribulations, hardships, sickness, pain, suffering, people leaving you, people pushing you away, people that you thought were friends and not your friends, people that you trusted, you found out you can't trust. That's, that happens to everybody. And you see the crowd going away and you want to follow the crowd. And I talked yesterday, um, what did I talk about yesterday? Somebody mentioned it. Well, I can't ask you what I talked about because I can't even remember. Huh? They, I, I, think, I think they may have been referring to something I talked about earlier. where I, No, I mentioned how you have to leave the camp. You have to go outside the camp. That's where Jesus went. He left the camp. Uh, Ruth left the land of her nativity. Abraham left his country. And God's trying to teach us to leave here. And I mean leave it. Leave it alone. Let the world be the world. You be God's child. And trust Him. Even if He doesn't appear to you, even if He doesn't show Himself to you, you have His Word. And a man, according to the way we see it, is as good as His Word. And God is as good as what He says. And He is as good as the Bible says He is. That's been proven to me over and over and over again. You know, I talk about Lisa's cancer. The fact that they found, Brother George, it was the size of the ball in a ballpoint pen. That's all the big it was. How they found that, I guess the grace of God, because 10 years ago she had a lump removed, and it scared us both enough to where every six months she's going back to the doctor getting checked every six months. We don't miss that. And there's a reason why. And we, they found the cancer at probably about the earliest stage that you can find it without knowing that it was there and removed it so that she can live. And that was the, that was, it's not that God didn't let her get cancer. It's that God showed his marvelous work through that. That's how we end up loving God the way we do. If somebody is just repeatedly nice to you, you know, for a while you might start thinking, what are they up to? What do they want? But after so long of them just being nice to you and giving to you and loving to you, at some point you ask yourself, why me? Why are you being so good to me? And God simply says, he told Israel in Deuteronomy 7, it's because I love you. Why did I send my only begotten son? Why did I do that? It's because I love those whom I created. I love them enough to, so that they, they are going to have trials because they chose sin. But even through that, God knows the sin. God knows the sin you committed this week. Okay? He knows all about it. He is already, if he wasn't willing to forgive you, he would have never saved you to begin with. And so, let that be an encouragement to you. Um, I feel like being a Barnabas today, a son of consolation. I'm just a great big glob of heaping love tonight. Amen. Uh, I'm supposed to mention Brian and Debbie McCartney. It is their 26th anniversary today. Give them a hand. They are good followers of us. They're, they're the people that hung around after homecoming. We couldn't get rid of them. 
No, that's just kidding. It was a, it was a joy to have them around, and um, so they're watching tonight. But they, they, on, there was bittersweet and everything. They got news today. Brian's mom, Helen is her name, uh, emphysema and cancer is what they found out, lung cancer. And so uh, they want us to pray for them. We have them on our list. We're going to pray for a Sister Bonnie tonight. Roy wants us to pray. Said a special extra prayer for her. So Roy will do that. Uh, let's take our Bibles tonight and uh, we'll go to the Lord in a word of prayer. I started this last Wednesday and um, let's go to Daniel chapter 2 and uh, we'll, we'll start over where we started last Wednesday to get our bearings and then I'll move through in my notes. But let's go to Daniel chapter 2 and we'll read that. And we'll go to prayer tonight. I appreciate you coming, but apparently uh, the message last Wednesday really struck home with some people and had somebody write in, said that they wanted copies of the sermon on CD. They wanted about seven of them, so we've made that. Kion me, I've got your sermon from Sunday on a CD on cancer. Had some good comments about that. And um, I preach what I go through. I preach what I'm going through. And that helps me, and I know that if God drug me through it, it's for a reason. And I asked him years ago that I made a promise to God that if he would help me, I would then turn around and help others. And he's never failed in that. And uh, I thank him to this very day for doing that. He's done it for me and he'll do it for you because I guarantee I'm nobody special. Daniel chapter 2 verse 31. The Bible says, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image... And think, think prophecy, think what's happening now with artificial intelligence, with uh, technology, quantum computers, DNA changing. Everything in the world is gearing toward Revelation 13. The false prophet causes everyone to build an image, to make an image to the beast. This image is different than any other image that man has ever made. Every image of a God that man has made, it's got a mouth but doesn't talk, eyes that cannot see. This image is going to be able to speak by itself. It's not going to be in some automatron where it's programmed to say certain words. It has a, This image comes to life and has a desire of its own. It's never happened on earth before, but it's going to happen. So this image, I see this as leading up to that. And the foundation of that image is that fourth kingdom built of iron and clay together. They're going to try to mix this together and it doesn't work. So thou, O king, saw behold a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and, and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone... And this is who Christ is. He's the stone cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Jesus always destroys his enemies utterly to pieces so that they're, they're, they're done. Israel did not wander 40 years looking behind them, seeing if Pharaoh was still chasing them. God eliminated him. Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's chariots and Pharaoh's chariot himself went into the Red Sea. God destroyed him utterly there. So God's telling Israel, what I did to save you, I saved you for good. He's never going to come back on you ever again. That's God. Amen. So break it to pieces. Verse 35, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And then if we look in verse 44, he explains to us, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. This stone is Christ. The fact that he's cut out without hands means man did not make Jesus. Man did not invent Jesus. Man did not write a character named Jesus into the Bible and said, this is who we're going to follow. 
even though it's made up, even though it's not true, we're going to follow this anyway. Man did not make God. God makes man. God makes man in his image. Amen? So this God, this stone is cut out without hands. He is not from mankind. He's from God, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom, you look at this. You're on the right team. You are playing for the right team. We are not going to lose. This kingdom shall never be destroyed, shall not be left to other people. Jesus is not going to abdicate the throne and let Satan come in and sit on his throne. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand for ever. That took you a little while. All right, let's go to uh, Isaiah 28. Then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. I'll give you a about eight seconds to turn to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, beautiful chapter. But we're looking at Christ as the stone. And what does that stone mean? Isaiah 28. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for a gorgeous day. Thank you for this cool weather. And uh, Lord, I understand that it's going to get hot again. But we'll take the cool weather while we got it. We thank you, Lord, for many blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the blessings of life, family, and love, fellowship. Thank you for sweet fellowship in your house. Thank you, dear God, for the grace that you bestowed upon us, the things that you brought us through, the things that you've helped us all with. God, you've been better to us than we have been to ourselves. We know that you love us. And Lord, you've proved it every day. You've done things for us, God, that we absolutely did not deserve. In fact, we deserved the punishment of hell. But you didn't give us that. And it's by your grace. And we thank you for that. We thank you for mercy and for pardon, for giving us a new life. Father, thank you, Lord, for helping us forsake the old sins. They're no good. They don't, they don't do for us what the devil told us they would do. And Father, we forsake them. We, we leave them behind. Don't want anything. Don't want to go back there ever again. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the stone that you have set the foundation of your church upon. It's not upon man. It's not upon human politics, human government. It is upon the rock of Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is our foundation, our stone of stumbling, Father, we thank you for him. We ask your blessing and your grace to be upon these people tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Isaiah 28. There's a lot in Isaiah 28. He starts out talking about the crown, verse 1, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim. And very quickly, drunkenness in the Bible, drinking strong drink. It is a, number one, it means what it says. God says, don't do this. Don't defy yourself with that. Um, you know, don't be, you, you're not supposed to get drunk in the Holy Spirit. Then where we go from here is we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does, what the Holy Spirit does not do. And the Holy Spirit does not ever make you drunk. Amen. Does not do that. Okay? Be sober, he said. So, we, we have the drunkards of Ephraim. And that wine and strong drink and drunkenness in the Bible is a symbol of false doctrine, false teachings that proceed out of the mouths of, remember the wine of Sodom. Its wine is the poison of dragons and the venom of asps, meaning that the teachings and the doctrines are poisonous. And they don't bring life, they bring death. They destroy, they kill. And so he's berating the drunkards of Ephraim, the priests and the prophets who are drunkards. How many preachers in this town? It's been found out they've been drunkards. Pastors that I know of that have been found out to be alcoholics. Drunkards. And I'm talking in one case, a fundamental King James Bible preacher. He's a drunkard, hiding it from everybody. But that's what he was. And I guarantee you, where that is, he's mingled false doctrine in his teaching somehow, some way. He has excused his own sins in order to perpetuate his own position in the church, is what he did. And it's all about false doctrine. 
False doctrine, when you're drunk, is there, is there ever anything solid? If you've ever been drunk, is there ever anything solid? No. Roads move. Lines move. The world moves. The seat you were going to sit on moved. There's nothing solid when you're drunk. So, God says in verse 9, I love this. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? God is seeking people who are interested in learning what he's got to say and believing it. God is interested in that. People say, well, it's not about doctrine. Doctrine kind of gets in the way. No, it doesn't. Doctrine is who we are. If we don't know what we believe and we don't stick with what we believe, we'll believe everything that comes along. And some people are that way. And they're never solid. You'll never get anything solid out of them. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. They've grown up. Precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Because that's how you read the Bible. Read, read over here in Judges for a while. Then read over here in Luke. Read over here in Daniel for a while. And then go over to the book of Hebrews. Read Genesis a little bit. Read some Psalms. And then go to uh, 1 Corinthians. But read it. And God will then start piecing together the pieces of his doctrine from the whole of Scripture. You're not going to find it all in one spot. You're going to get it from the whole of it. So, then he says, verse 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. The stammering lips was Moses. Moses was the stammerer. He was the stammering lips. The other tongue he's referring to is on the day of Pentecost, they spoke the Gentile languages of the people that were there at Jerusalem on that day. And everybody heard. It's not that they spoke and nobody understood it. And everybody said, wow, that must be God. Praise God. What did they say? Have no idea. Woo, amen. Amen. We don't know. They spoke and everybody knew what they were saying. They understood it. Amen. And you watch these people who have tongues. Because they have this idea that everybody must have them in order to go to the heaven. And they don't mind infiltrating Bible studies, churches, online groups, you name it. They will infiltrate in order to try to provoke that and pass that along. And it's nothing but babble. Stammering lips and another tongue. And, and God did that to Israel for a reason. Verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear... But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And their problem is, the Jews' problem is, they've got here a little, but they don't have there a little. The there a little is the New Testament, and they don't have it. So that they might go and fall which direction? Backwards. That's that tongues crowd. They always fall backwards. Fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So now, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone. You have hundreds of generations of people before you who've tried this. And they know it works. They know that the stone that their life was built upon by God never wavers, never moves, it's never crooked, it's always straight, and it's always solid. It's a, it's a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. That matches what Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you well that you do, do well that you take heed as into a light that shineth in a dark place. If you were, if you were trapped in a cave, which is one of my worst nightmares. If you were trapped in a cave, you would be looking for the light out. Amen? And if you saw the light, that's exactly where you got to go. We were all in that place at one time until God shone the light. He said, let there be light. And we followed that light. And he that believeth shall not make haste. Verse 17, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. God said in Amos, I've set a plumb line in the midst of my people. God's ways are always straight. They're always true. They're always right. God's word never fails. It never lies. It is the solid foundation of life. 
And everything that you seek to do in life, if you will do it the way the Bible says, you will be guaranteed that you'll bring forth fruit in season. Be guaranteed that. You'll be guaranteed that it'll last. Who wants to take a temporary job? Would you choose a temporary job over one that you know is going to last you the next 20 years? Take the one that you know that's going to last. Take the solid one. Take the one. Don't take these fly-by-nighters that come in town, give people jobs for a while, and then they cut out. All of a sudden, now you're left out. What was at that travel agency in London? Hundred and some odd years, a travel agency in London sending people all over the world. They buzzed out one day, called it quits, filed for bankruptcy, and left people stranded all over the world. Couldn't get back home. Who wants that? So he says, judgment will I lay to the lion and righteousness to the plummet. And hail, watch this, hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. I want you to turn to Ezekiel 13. Ezekiel 13, I'm going to explain this hailstorm. Here's what God's doing. Now you lay this in your heart. Lay it in your heart. Don't use this to judge anybody else but you. You make the application to you alone. Does it apply to other people? Absolutely. But your primary concern is you. So in Ezekiel 13, he, he gives a little bit of detail on what this hailstorm is all about. It's about revealing the foundation. It's about revealing that. God says, uh, look, in, you're in Ezekiel 13. Look at verse 3. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. And churches are full of that. Not just charismatic or Pentecostal churches, but churches everywhere where they have strayed away from the true teachings, the solid teachings of the Word of God to chase after modern fads, which fade away, doctrines of devils, which destroy and damn, they follow these things having forsaken the word of God. Or they follow their own spirit. That you cannot tell me that there are no pastors, pastoring churches in America right now that are not in it for the money. You cannot tell me that does not exist. I know it does, because I wanted to be one of them. That's what was in my heart a long time ago. So God says... Thy prophets are like foxes in the deserts. You have not gone up to, into the gaps nor either made the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord. Jesus called them hirelings. He just said the shepherd, the shepherd loves the sheep. He'll stay there. But the hireling, he works his shift, goes home and doesn't care. So he says then, verse... Um, Verse 7, have you, have you not seen a vain vision? Have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith it, albeit have not spoken it. So how can you tell whether or not God said it? If it's in the Bible, he said it. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and see lies. Therefore, behold, I'm against you, saith the Lord. Mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. And they shall not be in the assembly of my people. God says they're not even saved. Can you imagine... Being lost, wearing a religious robe, and dying and going to hell. All because you chose a religion over the foundation of the Word of God. You chose a denomination, or you chose a following, or you chose your own ideas, rather than Laying your life upon the, the book that has not been altered. So he says, verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord. Mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity, and that divine lies, they shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Their name is not the book of life. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord God. God says, when I do this, when I do this to your prophets, you're going to know that it was me that did it. And you're going to know I'm God. So, verse 10. Because, even because, they've seduced my people, saying, peace. And there was no peace. The equivalent to that today is telling people that they're going to heaven. 
who are not going to heaven. Telling people that God made them, they can stay in their sins, they can keep their sinful lifestyle, keep their sinful relationships, keep their sinful activities and their sinful thoughts. They can keep all these things without repentance, mind you, without repentance. They can keep these things and they can still go to heaven. That is seducing people, telling them that they have peace with God. But God said, there is no peace. There's enmity. And, and he said in verse 10, one built up a wall and lo others daubed it with untempered mortar. What does that mean? Untempered mortar. Kind of, what, what does, Brother George is our church lime expert. So they pull lime out of a cave and do they just grind it up, put it in bags and sell it? They got to, it's got to go through a kiln or Matthew said the guys down there called it a kills. It's got to go through a kiln, it's got to go through the heat and that transforms, it rearranges the molecules so that that lime now will do what it's supposed to. It'll turn to cement. Hard as a rock. And when man discovered that he could do that, he started doing all kinds of things with it. Back in the late 1800s, there was a limit as to how tall they built buildings in New York City because they were only building with brick and you could only go so high with brick and mortar. Then, when somebody came up with the idea of putting a steel framework in there, those steel girders, they realized there really is no limit now as to how high we can go. But that mortar has to be tempered, it has to go through the fire. I've been there. I've been there. It has to go through the fire. So now, when they lay that mortar and they put that stone or that brick on there, it's going to be there 100 years from now, 200 years from now, it's going to be there. How old are these houses up in St. Louis? Okay, now watch this. They build up a wall and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Walls are always a picture of salvation. And here's what they're doing. They're giving people temporary relief from their sin nature. Temporary. But not lasting, not permanent. So verse 11, say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower Ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. God says, I'm going to send stuff down from heaven. It's going to tear it all down. And then he said, Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith you daubed it? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it down to the ground, so that... The foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof and you shall know that I am the Lord. God said, I'm going to bring your whole house down on top of you. I don't know if you heard this, but a school in Kenya, Nairobi, collapsed, killed. How many students? Mick, eight, about seven or eight students, a bunch of others lay in the rubble for days couldn't get them out. You know why? Because somebody decided that those kids were not precious enough to bother building the house right. Next time you complain about building codes and standards in Jefferson County, most of them are there for a real reason. They may not make sense to you, but I guarantee you it's been tested by somebody. And if they say do it this way, you just do it that way. But somebody in Nairobi decided not to care enough about those children to build that building right. And it came down on top of those kids and killed them. That guy, whoever that was, I don't know if he paid. I don't know if it was a building inspector who was bribed to look the other way. That happens all the time. Happens here. I've seen it happen. Okay. But anyway, either way, God says, I, what I'm doing, I'm exposing what lies underneath? So that you'll understand this house wasn't worth keeping anyway. Number one, it wasn't built on a solid foundation. Number two, it was daubed with untempered mortar. And you know what that is? 
That is preachers giving them everything in the world except the Word of God. God showed me years ago, Mike, you have absolutely no power to change people for a permanent basis. Your words mean little to those people. It's my words that will be solid for them. It'll be the foundation for them. It'll be the tempered mortar that will cause the bricks and stones to adhere together for eternity. My words can't do that. Your words can't do that. Only the Word of God can do that. And we're living in a time now where nobody wants to hear the Word of God. They want to hear everything else. They want to hear some new thing. Oh, give me some new psychology lesson today. Give me seven tips on how I can do this right. And to them, it's all about self-help and, and everything else. But not the Word of God. And people don't realize it. But the foundation's bad. The walls are bad. And God says, I have a way. I'm going to send a storm. And it's going to tear down everything. And you, it's going to be discovered that you weren't built right to begin with. Now, to be by God's grace. I've had this happen to me. Where God literally tore everything down and said, Mike, you're not right. Now, let me do it my way. And I will build you a permanent house that will never pass away. He's talking about my salvation. He's talking about our church, our ministries. The impact the impact that I want what this church does in people's lives, I'm not looking for the instant impact. I'm looking for the eternal one. That's what I'm hoping for in your life. What you decide to do today doesn't impress me. How that you stayed around for 20 years, that impresses me. And that's the evidence that God did it His way. But it's that... That's what, if we go back to Isaiah 28, God said, Judgment also will I lay to the lion and righteousness to the plummet. Hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and water shall overflow the hiding place. Isaiah 28, 16 and 17 and Ezekiel 13 match. They're two bricks that go together and they give you an understanding of how it's supposed to be in your life. Quit going to the Christian bookstore looking for help. There's nothing there. When you've got a Bible and everything in it's free. And it will do things that no psychology at the bookstore will ever do. Dr. Phil doesn't have anything on God. Amen. Turn to Matthew 7. So this is that song we used to sing. We ought to sing it again. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his, come on, Jaden, do it with me. House upon the rock and the rain came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came on. Amen. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the rock stood firm. Amen. Now we hear it God's way. It's a little bit less notes, but it's better. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, he was specific. He did not say the sayings of the church, teachings of the church. He said these sayings of mine. Jesus was always very specific because he knew he was in the midst of a people who had taken. The Jews by this time had taken the Mount Sinai commandments and added so much garbage to them and traditions. After that, what was it? 1,000, 1,400, 1,500 years after Mount Sinai? They had added so much garbage to it. He said, you've made the whole word of God of none effect by your traditions. So he was always careful. Jesus was always careful to, to refer to his words. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and what? Do with them. Alexander Scorby was hired to read the entire King James Bible on tape. And to me, it's the greatest reading of the Word of God ever. And from my knowledge, the man didn't believe a word of it. He read it with such passion and such 
pros, but he didn't believe it. Isaac Asimov, you know who that is? Science fiction writer, wrote I, Robot, and, you know, theorized about the future. He wrote a commentary on the Bible. Didn't even believe in God, which means he read the Bible and didn't believe it. So whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. That's proof that you believe it. I will liken unto him, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Just one. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And I can tell when somebody comes in that they've been beaten down. Sometimes I can tell when you come in that the rain has beat you down. But by the grace of God, you're still here. Stop and think for a minute. Everything that the devil has tried to do to knock you out. Just think about it. The tactics, the temptations, the trials the sins he's tried everything to wear you down and when you look back you're like me you shake your head and going I don't see how in the world I'm even here today but it's because the rock was there the rock was there so the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded and the Watchman broadcast I recorded today focused on that word founded. A foundry. What is a foundry? Does anybody know? What is a foundry? Huh? Okay. They make things, build things. Okay. That's what that word literally means, founded. It was founded, meaning it was built upon a rock. There's companies now all over the place, and I focused on one today. There's companies everywhere that when they look at your DNA, they say, that's not good. And they have spent millions of dollars. They have a repository, they have the world's largest repository of freshly rewritten DNA samples. So that if a, a pharmaceutical company calls and says, uh, we've got an idea on how we can gain advantage over Alzheimer's. Do you have such and such DNA techniques? And they'll say, yeah, we have it. We've, we've worked on this already. We have it in a repository. We'll license it to you. And they call what they do the foundry. They are a foundry of new biology, and they're going to rewrite literally every species in the world. They're going to rewrite their DNA. That's not, I've seen all the movies. It's not going to work. I've read the Bible. I know it's not going to work. So you let God build it. For it was founded upon a rock. Verse 26, and everyone that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not. Notice what he says. Everyone that heareth these things of mine and doeth it not. It's not that they didn't hear. They didn't bother to believe it. And what you don't believe, you don't do. It's that simple. I have not attended a Communist Party meeting. Amen. I do not have a card as a member of the Communist Party. Why? I'm not a communist. I don't believe in it. I'm not going to join them, and I'm not going to send them money. And I'm not going to vote for their president or their comrade. I'm not going to do it. I don't believe in that. What I believe is this. That's why I'm here. So they heard the word. They didn't do it because they didn't believe it. Shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. You stupid people who got your house blown away in Hurricane Irma. And then you took that million dollars insurance check and built another one in the same place. I don't think FEMA ought to help them. If you're that stupid, you're just that stupid. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great 
was the fall of it. That's Babylon. Babylon falls because she has forsaken the rock. She heard it. She knew it. She knew that what it was telling her was right. She knew that things that she was doing was wrong. Babylon heard the word, decided not to live by it. And Babylon falls, always falls. At some point, you get tired of that. You don't want it anymore. Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and is marvelous in your eyes. So the question is, what are you building right now? What are you working on? Lisa is at home working on something. Healing. Her body has been destroyed. And it takes a lot of healing. And she's already learned, if she's up and around moving and doing stuff, it's, it's slowed her down. So that's why she's not here tonight. She decided, it's better for me to stay and work on healing God's way. My body will heal itself, but I have to let it. I have to do what's right. So that's why she's home tonight. And I want her there, because it bothers me to see the pain. It bothers me. I don't like it. I want my sweetie pie back. Because then she's got to get ready for the next one. Okay? But what are you building? What are you working on right now? I'm just telling you. If you're not doing it God's way. It'll fall. It'll collapse. It'll come right down on top of you. And you'll be sitting in that rubble going, I wish I'd never done this. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. He's talking about going from the Jews to the Gentiles. Bye, Ron. Love you, buddy. Whosoever, sh thank you for that. Whosoever shall fall, listen, listen to this. Whosoever shall fall on this stone and be broken. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. That is you falling at the foot of the cross, at the rock of Calvary, letting God break you so He can make you into a better... He's sending the hailstorms down to destroy what you did so that He can replace it. And I promise you, it'll be better than what you did. I've been through this. I've done it both ways. I'm telling you, it's better if God does it. So He said, "...whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken." Now look at the rest of that. He's telling you what's in Daniel 2. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. He's just referring to Daniel chapter 2. And the stone cut out without hands, grinding to powder those kingdoms. And when the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. And they were right. And that's why they hated him. And that's why they hate me. I got sent a copy of something that somebody wrote, a pastor, about me. And it wasn't nice. It wasn't nice. Accused me of all kinds of things. Saying that I said things that I know I never said. But what they do is they characterize it. And what I would say to this guy is, I challenge you to find that quote on anything I said. And it won't be hard. Just got to look on the internet. Okay? But they hate us. They hate us around here. They hate us in Kenya. They probably hate us in places we don't know about. I can't help it. Because all I'm doing is trying to tell you, God has a better way and a better stone. Amen? First Peter 2. Turn there. This, this is one of my favorite places in the Bible, and we'll close with this. We'll come to prayer. 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, concerning the Bible, 
Let's refresh our memories. What's rule number one? There are no mistakes in the Bible. What's rule number two? If you think the Bible's wrong, go back to rule number one. The Bible's never wrong. What I will tell you is, and I had a friend help me with this. He said, I believe there are stumbling stone verses in the Bible. I believe that there are verses in the Bible that because we don't understand the way God spoke it, it looks like it's a contradiction. God does that for a reason. Just like Jesus, when he showed up, he was not to their expectations. They had rewritten so much of the Old Testament that the Messiah they were looking for was not Christ. It was, it was another one. So 1 Peter 2 tells us that. Verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. That's about the second or third time or fourth time he said that about Jesus the rock. He's precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be what? Confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. Or he says it again. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone, think of Christ and think of this Bible, the stone which the builders disallowed because they won't use the King James Bible anymore. They won't use it. They refuse it. They disallow it. The same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them that which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So, these people look in the Bible, and King James, and they see the word Easter. And they go, aha! It's proven right there. They were all pagans. And they didn't know the Bible. They didn't know anything. And they thought they were celebrating Easter, this pagan festival. And it's there in the Bible. And that's a mistake. So that if you, here's the rule. There's another rule. If you think you found a mistake and you don't believe rule number one, the next rule is you will find thousands of them because you'll start looking at the Bible a different way and you'll be going, I don't think that's right. That's not right. That wasn't translated right. That was, and I got an email from a guy or he was left a comment on a YouTube video I did and he said, Hoggard's an idiot and he needs to get back to the Greek and Hebrew. King James is a good translation, but I've proven that it's wrong. Oh, I know who you are. You stumbled and fell over the very stone that you should have based your theology on, and you refused. You refused. So, he says in uh, 1 Peter 2, 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood do offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 42, very quickly. Peter is not the rock that the church is built upon. He's not the Pope. He was, there's no apostolic succession. So why did Jesus call uh, Peter a stone? And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is, by interpretation, a stone. And who is Peter? He is like us. He's a lively stone. Now, it is built upon the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. Prophets of the Old Testament. Apostles are the New Testament. But Jesus Christ, in those four Gospels, is the chief cornerstone. You can see the four Gospels as being the cornerstone. Four corners... Four Gospels, making sure that all of the prophets and the apostles are good and straight. Because they got their words from Jesus and not from man. You can trust this book, and I think you should. I think you should, before you go out and make a mistake you don't want to make. I've done it. You've done it before. We've all done it. I don't want to do it again. So, Brother George, if you come at me and say, Brother Mike, why don't you come over and help me rewire my, the electricity in my house? I will say, see you in heaven. So I ain't doing it. I don't touch them. Sterling comes over my house and he just jams screwdrivers and pliers and stuff and lights. And I'm going, stop it! You're going to die. 
He's it just, I just, I can't handle it. I've made that mistake. Don't want to do it again. Amen.